Okay, welcome back. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to, to um, be able to introduce Bob twice in two days. Uh, one thing I didn't mention in... Um, oh, Jason has just reminded me that I, I should interrupt the pleasure of, interrupt, of introducing Bob for the second time. To ask you who's coming to dinner tonight. If you'd like to come along to dinner tonight, could you raise your hands please? <laughs> okay, well, what, what I was about to say was that um, I just wanted to, to repeat something that, that Paul actually mentioned in his comments after Bob's talk last night. I mean, as Paul reminded us, Bob is um, actually here um, on holiday, and so um, we're, we're particularly privileged, I think, that um, he's been prepared to give up this amount of time um, to take part in this workshop and to give us the lecture tonight. So now I'm delighted to introduce him um, to speak to us on Kantian lessons about mind, meaning, and rationale. So, so. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Those of you who were here last night will recognize at various points that I'm uh, uh, going to be traversing some of the same territory that I did uh, last night, uh, coming from different directions. I mean, there's uh, central landmarks uh, you may well recognize. Uh, I, I think some of these different directions, the different contexts I'll put it in are uh, worthwhile, but uh, uh, you know, you'll still recognize the big landmarks of, uh, uh, of my view. Kant revolutionized our thinking about what it is to have a mind, but I think that what seemed to me some of his most important points typically don't get uh, recognized. And I think that's because they have to do with what he does rather than with what he says about what he's doing. He has a particular way of pitching uh, his project, and uh, there's certainly a good reason for him to do it that way. But I think some of the most important points that he makes, some of the most important philosophical moves that he makes, happen before the, the first page of the first critique. Uh, there are things that he, he's taking for granted in uh, the way he proceeds and doesn't thematize, do, doesn't uh, tell us about. So uh, I'm going to be extracting those lessons sort of from the general shape of his view rather than uh, from particular things that he said. Descartes notoriously gave uh, philosophical thought about the mind an epistemological turn by distinguishing between minds and bodies, the, the two main flavors of things, uh, in terms of the epistemic transparency and incorrigibility of the mental, uh, the, the immunity of mental things respectively to ignorance and error, thinking of the rest of the world as the things we could be ignorant about or in error about. Uh, the fact that thoughts could misrepresent their objects or represent them incompletely meant that our knowledge of the merely represented world was fallible and incomplete. But on pain of an infinite regress, he thought, those thoughts must themselves be thought of as known immediately by being had rather than by being represented in turn, which was the, the cause of their privileged epistemic status. Still, at the most basic level, I think Descartes just takes it for granted that the world comes in these two flavors, stuff that by nature represents and stuff that by nature is represented. And the representing stuff he thought of as intrinsically tanquam rem, as if of things. The question he focuses on is what reason we have to think that things are in fact as we represent them to be. His fundamental problematic is accordingly to explain the possibility of knowledge, of beliefs about things outside the mind that are both true and justified. How could we know that things really are as they appear to us? How could we justify that claim? By contrast, Kant gives philosophical thought about the mind a semantic term by shifting the center of attention from truth and justification to the nature of representation itself. He replaces concern with justifying claims to representational success by concern with understanding representational purport. His problem isn't in the first instance showing that things, that reality at least often is as it appears to us, but understanding what it is for things so much as to appear to be, one way rather than another. 
He wants to know what it is for mental states to be or to appear to us to be, to function as representings of represented objects. Kant sees that the epistemological question has semantic presuppositions, and the issue for him is not knowledge, but intentionality. You could think of each of those projects as responding to the threat of a kind of skepticism, but if so, Kant's skepticism, the one he's worried about, isn't epistemological skepticism, it's semantic skepticism. The idea that it might not, in the end, be fully intelligible to us, that things should even appear to us to be one way rather than another. In asking this question about the nature of intentionality, Kant moves to an issue that's clearly conceptually prior to the one that's central for Descartes. And this sort of move isn't merely of historical interest. The principal argument of Seller's masterwork, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, is that the soft underbelly of both traditional and logical empiricism is their implicit semantics. He saw that broadly Cartesian foundationalism depends on there being a semantically autonomous stratum of thought, something that's given, epistemologically to be sure, but more fundamentally semantically given. And it's the semantic givenness that Sellers ultimately takes issues, issue with. That is, Sellers offers Kantian semantic arguments against the epistemological myth of the given. More specifically, Sellers argues that there can't be an autonomous language game, one that one plays though one plays no other, that consists entirely of making non-inferential reports. Unless some claims can be made as the result of inferences, none of them can count as conceptually contentful in the sense that's required for them even potentially to offer evidence or justification for further conclusions. That is, he argues in effect that nothing that can't serve as the conclusion of an inference can serve as the premise of one either. We'll see further along that this too is a Kantian theme. But for now, I'm not concerned to say why we might think Sellers is right about this, though I think he is, only that he's recognizably uh, following up on Kant's response to Descartes. So, so far I've said that Kant points out that before one worries about whether or under what circumstances mental representation is or could be known to be generic, generically successful, one has to think hard about what it is for something to be taken or treated as to have the practical or functional significance of a representation at all. In classical epistemological terms, you have to understand what it is to believe that things are thus and so in order then to try to understand what it is for such a belief to be true or justified. But in fact, Kant commits himself to something much stronger than this. He thinks that any adequate answer to the possible semantic skeptic will also be an adequate answer to the epistemological skeptic. Satisfying the conditions under which there can be representings at all will settle it, he thinks, that some, indeed many of them, must be true. This is the ultimate idea behind his refutation of idealism. Once you've seen what's presupposed by representational purport, you'll see that it includes a substantial degree of representational success. Unless we're to a large extent right about how things are, we can't make sense of our being wrong, even, even in special cases. This, I think, is an exceptionally bold claim, and once again, it's been echoed and developed in our own times. Here we can think of Davidson's principle of charity based on his interpretivist semantic methodology, and the lesson that Putnam draws from his thought experiment about brains in uh, vats. Again, uh, an argument along these lines may or may not work, but Kant's idea that one could show on semantic grounds that we have sufficient reason to reject global epistemological skepticism about the truth and justification of our beliefs in general is a deep and radically original one, and people are still trying to make something like that work. So, on top of Kant's semantic transformation of philosophical problematics from epistemological to semantic, he builds a semantic explanatory aspiration that resolving the semantic problematic would resolve the epistemological one. The thought that's ultimately driving Kant here is the importance of distinguishing between what Frege calls force and content. This is the distinction between what one is doing in endorsing a claim taking it to be true, whether internally in judging or externally in asserting, on the one hand, and the content that one thereby endorses on the other. That is, I want to claim that Kant's practice depends on distinguishing between the two sides of what Sellers called the notorious ing-ed ambiguity, between judgment as the act of judging and as the content judged. This is a distinction of cardinal importance, for instance, 
in sorting out Barclay confusions, conflations, and equivocations regarding experience in the sense of experiencings and what's experienced. The Kant Frege claim is that to think of merely entertaining a representation as something one can do is to fail to appreciate the distinction between judging and what's judged, between force and <coughs> content. And here I think it's worth backing up a little. The tradition that Kant inherited understood judging as predicating, classifying something particular as being of some general kind, applying a universal concept to a particular one. Although Kant continues to use the traditional language, ultimately derived from this term logic, thereby, I think, distracting attention from the radical break he's making with the tradition at this point, he sees that this will not do. His table of the forms of judgment includes conditional judgments, disjunctive, negative, and most important, modal judgments, none of which kinds is happily assimilated to the predicational classificatory model. The underlying thought, though, I think, is not made fully explicit until Frege. It turns out, we can now see, thanks to Frege, that in the traditional theory, the notion of predication is being asked to do two incompatible jobs. On the one hand, it serves as a structural way of building up new judgeable contents. And on the other hand, it's thought of as a kind of doing that has the significance of endorsing those contents. The collision between these two senses in which predication might be thought of loosely as an operation is clearest when one thinks about judgeable contents appearing as the unasserted, unendorsed components of more complex sentences or judgments. The conditional is a paradigm for Kant as for Frege. When I assert if P of A, then P of B, I've not asserted P of A. Have I predicated P of A? If so, then predication does not amount to endorsement. Predicating is not, as the tradition had it, judging. But if not, it looks as though there's an equivocation when I detach from the conditional, reasoning if P of A, then P of B, but P of A, so P of B. For the second premise is a predication, and on this line, the antecedent of the first premise is not a predication. So it looks like there's an equivocation. Geach famously picks up this Kant Frege point, using it in his masterful gem like essay, Ascriptivism, to argue against emotivist semantic analyses of terms of moral evaluation. And this is actually the master argument against expressivism that uh, uh, Blackburn has worried about so much. Geach's target is theories that understand the normative significance of terms such as good, not as part of the content of what's said about an act, not as specifying a characteristic that's being attributed, but rather as marking the force of the speech act. Calling something good on this target line is thought of as doing something distinctive, commending, saying boo or hurrah. Geach first asks what the limits of this ploy are. What are the rules of this game? He points to the archaic English verb to macarize, meaning to characterize someone as happy. Does the possibility of understanding calling someone happy as macarizing her mean that happiness is not a property being invoked in specifying the content of the claim that someone's happy? Because in saying that, what we're really doing is doing something else, performing the special speech act of macarizing. But if we can do that with happy, why not with mass or with red? Just what are the rules of this game? What are the limits of the ploy? Geach then suggests the embedding test. Look to see if an expression can be used to construct a judgeable content that's not directly used to perform a speech act. Paradigmatically, put it in the antecedent of a conditional. So for instance, because imperatival force is grammatically marked, we can't say, if shut the door, then something else. But we certainly can say things like, if he's happy, then I'm glad. Or if that's a good thing to do, then you have reason to do it. And in the first of these, I have not macarized anyone. And in the second, I've not commended any action. It follows that the terms good and happy do contribute to the specification of content and are not to be understood as mere force indicators. I call this essay masterful and gem-like. It's six pages long. Geach makes his point, refutes this entire uh, tradition in its classic form and then gets out. He said what he needs to say. Worrying about compound forms of judgment containing unendorsed judgeable contents as components required Kant to distinguish the operations by which such contents are constructed 
from the activity of endorsing the results of those operations. After Kant, you really can't think of judgment as predication. You can't use this classificatory model of <coughs> consciousness anymore, which of course hasn't stopped people from doing it, but only because they didn't uh, appreciate the force of this kant frege point. So for this reason, Kant couldn't take over the traditional classificatory theory of consciousness, which depends on understanding judging as predicating. That was basically the idea that every philosopher before Kant, I want to say, had operated with uh, some variant of this uh, notion of judgment as predication, a classificatory notion of consciousness. Kant sees that that won't do. He needs a brand new idea. What is it that you're doing when you're judging? And here's where Kant comes up with what's perhaps his deepest and most original idea, the axis around which I see all of his thought as revolving. What distinguishes judging and intentional doing from the activities of non-sapient creatures is not that they involve some special sort of mental processes, but that they're things that the judgments and actions are things that knowers and agents are in a distinctive way responsible for. Judging and also acting involve commitments. They're endorsements. They're exercises of authority. Responsibility, commitment, endorsement, authority. These are not Kant's words. These are the words I'm using to make his point. They're all normative notions. Judgments and actions make knowers and agents liable to characteristic kinds of normative assessment. His most basic idea is that minded creatures are to be distinguished from unminded ones, not by some matter of fact ontological distinction, the presence of mind stuff, but by a normative deontological one. This is his normative characterization of the mental. And it's the result of seeing what was wrong with the old predicational classificatory model of consciousness. Drawing on a jurisprudential tradition that includes Grotius, Puffendorf, and Crusius, Kant talks about norms in the form of rules. Judging and acting, endorsing claims and practical maxims, committing ourselves as to what is or shall be true is binding ourselves by norms, making ourselves subject to assessment according to rules that articulate the contents of those commitments. And those norms, those rules, he calls concepts. And in a strict sense, all a Kantian subject can do is apply concepts, either theoretically in judging or practically in acting. Discursive, concept-mongering creatures are normative creatures, creatures who live and move and have their being in a normative space. It follows then that for him, the most urgent philosophical task is to understand the nature of this normativity, the bindingness, the validity, <coughs> verbindlichkeit, gültigkeit of conceptual norms. This master idea has some of Kant's most characteristic innovations as relatively immediate consequences. The logical tradition that understood judging as predicating did so as part of an order of semantic explanation that starts with concepts or terms, particular and general, and advances on that basis to an understanding of judgments, now we can say in the sense of judgeables, as applications of general to particular terms, and builds on that basis an account of inferences or consequences construed syllogistically in terms of the sort of predication or classification exhibited by the judgeables that appear as its premises and conclusions. In a radical break with this tradition, Kant takes the whole judgment to be the conceptually and explanatorily basic unit at once of meaning, cognition, awareness, and experience. Concepts and their contents are to be understood only in terms of the contribution they make to judgments. Concepts, he says, are functions of judgment. Well, why does he adopt this semantic order of explanation? I think it's because judgments are the minimal units of responsibility, the smallest semantic items that can express commitments. The semantic primacy of the propositional, I'm saying, is a consequence of the central role that Kant accords to the normative significance of our conceptually articulated doings. In Frege, what I think is this very same thought shows up as the claim that judgeable contents are the smallest unit to which pragmatic force can attach, paradigmatically assertional force. And in the later Wittgenstein, it shows up as the claim that sentences are the smallest linguistic units with which one can make a move in the language game. 
Now, if I'm right about this, Kant conditions the semantic account of content on the pragmatic account of force. And the way that his story about what's endorsed is shaped by his normative story about what endorsing is, is a kind of methodological pragmatism. In this sense, his most basic pragmatism consists not in the explanatory privileging of practical discursive activity over theoretical discursive activity, though there's a sense in which Kant did that too and his successors learned that from him, but rather his explanatory privileging of force over content within both the theoretical and the practical domains. And I think this is a sort of pragmatism that has not typically been recognized in Kant. Kant's idea is that his normative characterization of mental activity, understanding judging and acting as endorsing, taking responsibility for, committing oneself to some content, his idea that that's the place to start in understanding and explaining the nature of the representational object presenting judgeable contents of those judgings. That's his pragmatic turn. And it's this order of explanation that's responsible for the most general features of Kant's account of the form of judgment. The subjective form of judgment, the I think that can accompany all our judgings, and so, he says in its pure formality, is the emptiest of all representations. Well, thought of in terms of the normative pragmatics of judgment, it's the mark of who is responsible for the judgment. The transcendental unity of apperception is transcendental because the sorting of endorsements into co-responsibility classes is a basic condition of the normative significance of commitments. Committing myself to the animal being a fox or to driving you to the airport tomorrow morning normatively preclude me from committing myself to its being a rabbit or to my sleeping in tomorrow. But they don't in the same way constrain the commitments that others might undertake. The objective form of judgment, the object equals X, to which judgments always by their very, very form as judgments, he says, make implicit reference. Thought of in terms of the normative pragmatics of judgments, it's the mark of what one has made oneself responsible to by making a judgment. It expresses the objectivity of judgments in the sense of their having intentional objects, what they purport to represent. And the important point here is that the understanding of the intentional directedness of judgments, the fact that they're about something, that they're about something, is through and through a normative one. What the judgment is about is the object that determines the correctness of the commitment one has undertaken by endorsing it. In endorsing a judgment, one has made oneself liable to distinctive kinds of normative assessment. And what one is thinking or talking about is what plays a special role, what exercises a special sort of authority in such assessments. Representing something, talking about or thinking of it, is acknowledging its semantic authority over the correctness of the commitments one is making and judging. So representational purport, too, is a normative phenomenon, and representational content is to be understood in terms of it. Again, backing up a little, intentionality, semantic contentfulness, comes in two flavors, what we could call of intentionality and that intentionality. The first, or representational dimension, is semantic directedness at objects, what one is thinking of or talking about. The second, or expressive dimension, concerns the content of thought and talk, what one is thinking or saying about what one is thinking or talking about. So one can think of or about foxes that they are nocturnal omnivores. What falls within the scope of the of in such a specification is typically a term, well, what follows the that in such phrases as I think or John thinks that foxes are nocturnal omnivores is a declarative sentence. The pre-Kantian early modern philosophical tradition took it for granted that one ought first to offer an independent account of representational of intentionality, of what it is to represent something, and only then, on that basis, to explain expressive or that intentionality what it is to judge or claim that things are thus and so. And it's part and parcel of Kant's semantic revolution to reverse also that order of explanation. And that is to say that just as he needed a new and different idea about what one is doing in judging on the pragmatic side of force, which, which parenthetically gives him a way of talking about 
uh, probabilistic judgments, normative judgments, modal judgments, you know, in terms of the commitments that they involve, things that the tradition had a hard time, just as he needed a new and different idea about what one is doing in judging on the pragmatic side of force, so he needs a new and different idea about what that force attaches to or is invested in on the semantic side of content. His thought that judging is taking responsibility, committing oneself, requires a corresponding characterization of what one thereby becomes responsible for, commits oneself to. The contents of judgments, we said, are articulated by concepts. The conceptual faculty, the understanding, is the faculty of judgment. Concepts articulate the concepts of, concepts of judgments by determining what one would make oneself responsible for, what one would be committing oneself to, were one to endorse those contents. I think at this point Kant wheels in a Leibnizian idea. Concepts are in the first instance rules that determine or express what's a reason for what. The concepts being applied determine what follows from a given claimable, and hence what else one would have committed oneself to or made oneself responsible for by endorsing it. And they determine what counts as rational evidence for or justification of a claimable, hence what would count as a reason for endorsing it. An essential element of what one is responsible for in endorsing a claim or a practical maxim is having reasons for doing so. That's part of the responsibility that goes with investing one's authority in the claim or maxim. Again, parenthetically, uh, one important path from Kant to Hegel is thinking about uh, the nature of the reciprocal presupposition of authority and responsibility that Hegel saw in Kant, but didn't see a theory of why each kind of authority came with a correlative responsibility. It, Hegel built deep into his metaphysics uh, a reciprocal correlative relation between authority and responsibility. Norms have to have a content, and the concepts that articulate those contents are rules specifying in the first instance what's a reason for what. We'll see later that to complete that semantic story, uh, he's got to have a root from an account of what's a reason for what, an account of that intentionality, to an account of what we've made ourselves responsible to by undertaking that responsibility. That is, an account of, of uh, or representational intentionality. And I'll say something later on about how he uh, does that. As normative creatures, then, we're rational creatures. Not in the sense that we always or even generally do what we ought or have good reason to do. That doesn't matter to Kant. We're rational creatures in the sense that whether we do or not, we're always liable to normative assessment concerning our reasons for doing what we do or thinking as we do. However sensitive we are in fact on any particular occasion or even in general to the normative force of the better reason, that peculiar force at once compulsory but not always compelling that so fascinated and puzzled the ancient Greek philosophers. However sensitive we actually are to the force of the better reason, we are the kind of creatures we are, knowers and agents, creatures whose world is structured by the commitments we undertake, only because we're always liable to normative assessment of our reasons. Discursive creatures are those bound by conceptual that is to say, inferentially articulated norms. It's at this level that Kant applies the lessons he learned from his rationalist predecessors. Against the background of this set of ideas about normativity and rationality, which is to say, his new and in many ways unprecedented ways of understanding pragmatic force, what you're doing in judging, and semantic content, what that force in, is invested in, and their relations to one another, what I call the methodological pragmatism that seeks to read off an account of semantic content from an account of pragmatic force, it's against the background of that constellation of ideas that Kant introduces a radically novel conception of freedom. And this may seem like a complete change of topic from the semantics and pragmatics I've been talking about, but it isn't for him. Before Kant, freedom had traditionally been understood in negative terms as freedom from some kind of constraint. He revolutionized our thought by introducing a special idea of positive freedom, the freedom to do something. Positive freedom in this sense is a kind of ability or practical capacity. 
Not surprisingly, Kant's specific conception of positive freedom is normative. Being free is being able to adopt normative statuses, paradigmatically being able to commit oneself to undertake responsibilities. It's the capacity to bind oneself by conceptual norms in judgment and in action. This is exercising a certain kind of inferentially articulated authority, a kind that comes with a correlative rational responsibility to have reasons for one's endorsements, one's exercise of that authority. To use an example suggested by Kant's metaphor in Vasistov Clairon, consider what happens when young people achieve their legal majority. Suddenly they can enter into contracts and so legally bind themselves. Hence they can do such things as borrow money, start businesses, take out mortgages. This change of normative status involves a huge increase in positive freedom. The difference between discursive creatures and non-discursive ones is likewise to be understood in terms of the sort of normative positive freedom exhibited by concept users. On this Kantian account, being free is not only compatible with being constrained by norms, it consists in being constrained by norms. And since the norms, remember, are conceptual norms, their content is articulated by reasons. So positive normative freedom is also the capacity to act for reasons. Not in the causal sense that if we trace back the antecedents of your act, we'll find your acknowledgement of a reason, but in the normative sense of the ability to bind oneself by norms that make one liable to assessment as to one's reasons. Whatever made you act that way, you've made yourself liable to assessment as to what your reasons were. This constellation of ideas about normativity, reason, and freedom is, I think, what Heidegger meant when he talked about the dignity and spiritual greatness of German idealism. And I think it's a constellation of ideas that we're still only beginning to digest. One of the permanent intellectual achievements and great philosophical legacies of the Enlightenment was the development of secular conceptions of legal, political, and moral normativity. In the place of traditional appeals to authority derived ultimately from divine commands, thought of as ontologically based on the status of the heavenly Lord as the creator of those he commands, Enlightenment philosophers conceived of kinds of responsibility and authority, commitment and entitlement, that derived rather from the practical attitudes of human beings. So for instance, in social contract theories of political obligation, Normative statuses are thought of as instituted by the intent of individuals to bind themselves, thought of there on the model of promising or entering a contract. But the point I care about is that political authority is there understood as ultimately derived from its, perhaps only implicit, acknowledgement by those over whom it's exercised. Following Rousseau, Kant radicalizes this line of thought, developing on its basis a new criterion of demarcation for the normative a criterion of demarcation in terms of autonomy. This is the idea that we're genuinely normatively constrained only by rules that we've constrained ourselves by, that we adopt and acknowledge as binding on us. On this line, the difference between non-normative compulsion and normative authority is that we're genuinely normatively responsible only to what we acknowledge as authoritative. In the end, Kant, like Rousseau thinks, we can only bind ourselves in the sense that we're only really bound by the results of exercises of our freedom, self-bindings, commitments that we have undertaken. The acknowledgement of authority may be merely implicit, as when Kant argues that in acknowledging others as concept users, we're implicitly also acknowledging a commitment not to treat their concept using activities as mere means to our own ends. So he thinks there can be background commitments that are part of the implicit structure of rationality and normativity as such. Still, even in these cases, the source of our normative statuses is understood to lie in our normative attitudes. Merely natural creatures are bound only by rules in the form of laws whose bindingness is not at all conditioned on their acknowledgement of those rules as binding on them. But normatively free rational creatures are also bound by norms which is to say by rules that are binding only insofar as they're acknowledged as binding by those creatures. As Kant says, we're bound not just by rules, but by our conceptions of rules. Now, I think it's important to notice 
that this picture requires the strict conceptual separation of the content of norms from their normative force. The Kant Rousseau autonomy understanding of the nature of the force or bindingness of norms, the criterion of demarcation of the normative in terms of autonomy, in terms of binding being self-binding, it means that only we can normatively bind ourselves. It's in the end up to us what we're committed to and responsible for. But if not only the normative force, but also the contents of those commitments were, were up to us, then to paraphrase Wittgenstein, whatever seems right to us would be right, and talk of what's right or wrong could get no intelligible grip. That is, no norm would have been brought to bear, no genuine commitment undertaken. <coughs> Put another way, autonomy, binding oneself by a norm, rule, or law, has to have two components, corresponding to autos and nomos. One must bind oneself, but one must also bind oneself. And if not only that one is bound by a certain norm, but also what that norm involves, what's correct or incorrect according to it, is up to the one endorsing it, then the notion that one is bound, that a distinction has been put in place between what's correct or incorrect according to the norm, goes missing. That is to say, the attitude dependence of normative force, which is what the autonomy thesis asserts, is in principle intelligible only in a context in which the boundaries of the content are not, up, are not in the same way attitude dependent. What I acknowledge as constraining me, and by that acknowledgement make into a normative constraint on me, in the sense of opening myself up to the normative assessments according to it, cannot be up to me in the same sense, in the same way as whether I'm bound is. This is just a criterion of adequacy of making the notion of normative constraint intelligible. Kant secures this necessary division of labor by appeal to concepts as rules that determine what's a reason for what, and so, as we'll see, what falls under the concept so articulated. His picture of empirical activity as consisting in the application of concepts, of judging and acting as consisting in endorsements of propositions and maxims, strictly separates the contents endorsed from the acts of endorsing them. The latter is our responsibility, the former is not. The judging or acting empirical consciousness, for Kant, always already has available a stable of completely determinate concepts. Its function is to choose among them, picking which ones to invest its authority in by applying them to objects, and hence which conceptually articulated responsibility to assume, which discursive commitments to undertake. Judging that what I see up ahead is a dog, applying that concept in perceptual judgment, pulling that concept off the shelf uh, of available ones, may initially be successfully integratable into my transcendental unity of apperception, in that it's not incompatible with any of my other commitments. But subsequent empirical experience may normatively require me to withdraw that characterization, put that concept back on the shelf, pull another one off, and apply instead, say, the concept fox. That's my activity and my responsibility. But what other judgments are compatible with something being a dog or a fox is not up to me. It's settled by the contents of those concepts, by the particular rules I can choose to apply to bind myself by. In taking this line, Kant is once again adopting a characteristic rationalist order of explanation. It starts with the idea that empirical experience presupposes the availability of determinate concepts. For apperception, awareness in the sense required for sapience, awareness that can have cognitive significance, is judgment, and judgment is the application of concepts. Even classification of something particular as, something, as of some general kind counts as awareness only if the general kind one applies is a concept, that is, something whose application can both serve as and stand in need of reasons constituted by the application of other concepts. When an iron pipe rusts in the rain, it is in some sense classifying its environment as being of a certain general kind. But it is in no interesting sense aware of it. The rationalist thought is one must always already have concepts in order to be aware of anything at all. Kant, I've said, understands apperception, what the transcendental unity of apperception is a unity of, which is to say judgment, in normative terms. I've expressed by means of concepts such as commitment, responsibility, and endorsement. The transcendental unity of apperception, it's clear, is a normative unity. 
Judges, as such, are obliged to renounce commitments to contents that are incompatible with their other commitments, or which have such commitments as their consequences. For, if two commitments are incompatible, each serves as a reason to give up the other. That normative unity is transcendental because reference to objects, the representational of intentionality, that Kant is concerned to show is a necessary substructure of inferential that intentionality, is secured in part precisely by repelling incompatible commitments. I think this works like this. The judgment that A is a dog is not incompatible with the judgment that B is a fox. The judgment that A is a dog is incompatible with the judgment that A is a fox. Taking a dog judgment to be incompatible with a fox ju judgment is then taking them to refer to or represent an object, the same object. Again, taking it that A is a dog does not entail that B is a mammal, but taking it that A is a dog does entail that A is a mammal. Drawing the inference from the dog judgment to the mammal judgment is taking it that the two judgments refer to the same object. This triangulation by acknowledging incompatibilities and inferences is, in a nutshell, how the normative demand for a rational unity of apperception of judgments makes intelligible representational purport. It is what it is to take or treat judgments as representing or being about objects. I think this is what Hegel gives a much more articulated analysis of in the perception section of uh, the phenomenology, and he's worried just about this issue. It follows that for concepts to perform their function in articulating the transcendental unity of apperception, the inferential and incompatibility relations they stand into one another must be settled independently of and antecedently to our particular applications of them in judgment. Of course, this is just the point at which the pre-Kantian rationalists notoriously face the problem of where determinate concepts come from. If they're presupposed by experiential awareness, then it seems they can't be thought of as derived from it, for instance, by abstraction. Once the normative apperceptive enterprise is up and running, further concepts may be produced or refined by various kinds of judgment. For instance, the ref judgments of reflection that Kant talks about in the third critique. But concepts must always already be available for judgment and hence apperception to take place at all. Empirical activity, paradigmatically apperception in the form of judgment, presupposes transcendental activity, which is the rational criticism and rectification of one's commitments, making them into a normatively coherent unified system, which is what taking them to have representational purport consists in. Defining that normative unity requires the availability of concepts with already determinate contents, that is, roles and reasoning. Leibniz's appeal to innateness is not an attractive response to the resulting explanatory demand. And it wouldn't be much improvement to punt the central issue of the institution of conceptual norms from the realm of the empirical into the realm of noumenal activity. I think it's a nice question just how Kant's account does deal with this issue. As I read him, Hegel criticizes Kant on just this point. He sees Kant as having been uncharacteristically but culpably uncritical about the origin and nature of the determinate contentfulness of empirical concepts. Hegel's principal innovation is his idea that in order to follow through on Kant's fundamental insight into the essentially normative character of mind, meaning, and rationality, we need to recognize that normative statuses, such as authority and responsibility, are always at base social statuses. Hegel takes it that the Enlightenment tradition was right to see normative statuses as instituted by normative attitudes. There were no such things as commitments and entitlements, responsibility and authority, before we started practically taking or treating each other as committed and entitled, responsible and authoritative. Think in this connection about the example I appealed to a minute ago of the young one who achieves legal majority on reaching the age of 21. The transformation in positive freedom is vast, but it's not the consequence of some magic, magical inner transformation of the youth. It's wholly a shift in social status. All that changes is that others now take the individual to be able to commit himself, hold him responsible for what he does, acknowledge his authority, so to bind himself. On this Hegelian social line, 
there's something importantly right about the Kant-Rousseau demarcation of the normative in terms of autonomy. We should think of each of us as bound only by the commitments we ourselves have undertaken, explicitly or implicitly. But that autonom autonomy claim about normative force, that one is genuinely normatively bound only by what one has bound oneself by, commitments one has oneself endorsed, is, we saw, intelligible, is intelligible in principle only against the background of a social division of labor concerning the relation between normative force and normative content. That's the Hegelian idea, I'm saying. Here, Hegel thinks that what we might call Kant's methodological individualism critically impoverishes his explanatory resources. It's an absolutely essential part of Hegel's story that we hold each other responsible, acknowledge each other's authority. Self-regarding practical normative attitudes can't, he thinks, by themselves underwrite conceptual contents that swing sufficiently free of a knower's or agent's attitude to count as genuinely normatively constraining her as articulating determinate commitments and responsibilities. Hegel's term for the normatively articulated realm of discursive activity, what Kant calls the realm of freedom, is geist, spirit, and at its core is language. Language is the Dasein of Geist, Hegel says. This is where concepts, which for Hegel as for Kant, is to say norms, have their actual public existence. Here one might think of Seller's principle that grasp of a concept is always mastery of the use of a word. Here's how I think the social division of labor works on Hegel's picture. It is up to me which counter in the game I play, which move I make, which word I use. But it's not then up to me, at least not in the same sense, what the significance of that counter is, what other moves it precludes or makes necessary, what I've said by using that word. It is up to me what concept I apply in a particular judgment, whether I claim that the coin is made of copper or silver, for instance. But if I claim that it's copper, <clears throat> it's not then up to me what move I've made, what else I've committed myself to by using that term. So for instance, I have thereby committed myself, whether I know it or not, to the coin melting at 1084 degrees C, but not to 1083 degrees C, and to its being an electrical conductor, not an insulator. In the sense that if those claims aren't true, then neither is the one I've made. And I've made a claim that's incompatible with saying that the coin is, is an electrical insulator. I can bind myself by these determinate conceptual norms because they're always already there in the always already up and running communal linguistic practices into which I enter as a young one. An essential part of what maintains them is the attitudes of others. In this case, principally the metallurgical experts who would hold me responsible for those commitments on the basis of my performance if the issue of ro arose. Of course, in this way, the issue of the ultimate origins of concepts is only displaced from the individual mind to the whole linguistic community, from the relatively recent to the relatively distant past. I think, in fact, there's a convincing story to be told about what it is for the normative light to dawn slowly over the whole among our hominid ancestors, but I'm not going to follow out that particular argumentative thread any further here. <clears throat> 